hello everyone. I am Amr Suleiman. I am a PhD student in the University at Buffalo. So I do my research on the supervision of Professor Ravi Ranadi. So I'm glad to be here to present my research on the shear behavior of UHPC. So UHPC can be used uh, to connect uh, bridge elements, so to connect, for example, precast bridge girders with uh, slabs in order to achieve the composite behavior. So these are two examples of uh, connections to link the girder to the slab. So in this case, the UHPC is required to transfer the horizontal shear flow in order to achieve the composite behavior. So in such case, we, we may get an interface shear problem at the interface of the UHPC uh, due to the direct shear failure. So in general, when cracks open and propagate, there are uh, three modes of crack opening. The first one is when the crack is subjected to normal loads uh, perpendicular to the crack direction. So this is under pure tension. The second case is when the crack is subjected to forces parallel to the crack under sliding mode. And the third mode is when the crack is subjected to out-of-plane forces you'll get tearing opening of the crack. So the first mode is the most common where we get cracking due to the tension. In this case, when the crack opens uh, in fiber and faucet concrete in general or UHPC, the fibers bridging the crack, they provide uh, strengthen, strengthening or bridging of the crack through tension of the fibers. So in this case, the force is transferred as axial tension in the fibers and then transferred to the matrix through the friction or the fiber matrix bond. In the case of mode two crack, when we have sliding of the crack plane, in this case, uh, some, some inclined fibers will be subjected to tension as well, but most of the fibers will not be subjected to tension, but in this case, they will resist the force or transfer the force through the dowel action across the crack. So in this case, the dowel action will govern the behavior, so we expect that the dowel action may not be necessarily related to the uniaxial behavior, so it will depend more on the lateral stiffness of the fiber or, la or lateral strength, depending on the material of the fiber as well. So the fiber and faucet composites in general are categorized based on their tensile behavior into strain softening materials. So the strain softening materials uh, have uh, the fiber bridging capacity is lower than the cracking strength. So after forming one crack, the strength drop directly even when you have fibers, the fibers provide some bridging in this case. And we have strain hardening materials. So the strain hardening materials uh, provide more cracks. So after the matrix crack, in this case, the fibers can provide higher bridging capacity. So this can force the material to form more and more cracks and to have larger deformation capacity. So in these materials, we can achieve very large uh, strain capacities up to three or 4% by forming uh, multiple cracking behavior in the material. Uh, example of that is the ECC. And I would say the UHPC is somewhere in between these two materials or these two classes because UHPC provides some strain hardening because of the good bond between the fibers and the matrix of the UHPC. But at the same time, it doesn't provide same strain hardening behavior as, for example, the ECC. So the UHPC usually have very low strain capacity compared to the ECC, for example. And in the recent years, there were some efforts to combine the high strength of the UHPC with the strain hardening behavior from the ECC to produce a strain hardening UHPC mix. So the goal in this study is to use these different classes of materials to see how their tensile behavior correlate to the direct shear behavior. So the first material that we're using here is a strain softening mix. So this is designed by using a UHPC matrix and uh, using 1% steel fibers. So the fibers used here are the 13 millimeter straight fibers. And this is an example of the uh, stress versus strain tensile behavior of this mix. The second mix is a UHPC, so the same matrix as the first one, but using 2% fibers. So we get higher tensile strength and better ductility in this case. The third mix is also UHPC, so it has the same behavior as mix two, but in this case it has higher strength so we achieve that by using steel wool in addition to the steel fibers. So the steel wool are obtained uh, from recycled uh, steel scrap uh, industry, and they are much smaller than fibers, so their median length is around one uh, millimeter. So the steel wool act to bridge the micro cracks in the matrix, so they reinforce the matrix itself, and they improve the bond between the matrix and the steel fibers. So that's why we get better tensile behavior.
And then MIX4 uh, represents here a strain hardening UHPC mix. So this is a different UHPC comp uh, mixture and using uh, polyethylene fibers in this case. And the, finally, the last material is ECC. So both of these two materials uh, show strain hardening behavior, but different strength uh, for the sake of comparison. These are the mechanical properties of the different mixes. So the first four mixes are UHPCs. They have very uh, comparable compressive strengths. And uh, there is some variation in the tensile strength, uh, as I mentioned. And the strain capacity of the first three is very low. And the fourth mix uh, has the strain hardening behavior. In order to test the direct shear behavior, we perform a push-off uh, specimens under compression load. So this uh, figure shows the uh, setup of the specimen. So we just use some uh, reinforcement at the side to prevent any damage or any failure. And in this study, we just focus on the unreinforced specimens to see how the effect of the different tensile uh, behavior of different materials uh, affect these direct shear. Uh, this is an example of the mold before casting the UHPC. And then the specimens are tested under compression load uh, with a displacement control machine. And the uh, deformation of the specimen is recorded uh, here through vertical linear pots to measure the slip with respect to the uh, shear strain, and two linear pots to measure the crack opening with, the sh with the respect to the shear strain. And the other side of the specimen, we use a speckled pattern and using uh, taking photos during the test and then using uh, digital image correlation to measure the strain uh, on the surface of the specimen. So after testing the specimens, these are the results. So the first four mixes from M1 to M4 show, of course, much higher strength than the ECC, as we expect. And all of them showed a nonlinear behavior until reaching the peak, and then they failed in a greater failure shortly after the peak. Uh, the ECC showed a much ductile behavior. So even after reaching the peak, it showed a gradual uh, stre stress, strength loss. Uh, this figure showed the uh, shear strength of the different mixes and the cracking strength. So in this case, we can expect that the shear behavior uh, is compromised of two contributions or two components. The first one is the matrix component until you have a crack. And then after the crack, the fibers contribute to, to provide some bridging stress or some higher st shear stress. So in this case, by comparing mix one and mix two, both of them have the same UHPC material. So we see that both of them have the same cracking strength. But here, the post-cracking strength in mix two is higher because it has 2% fibers compared to 1% in mix one. And here, mix three is stronger. The matrix itself is stronger. So that's why it had higher cracking strength. And the post-cracking contribution here is almost similar to mix two because they have the same fiber content. And then uh, mix four and mix five, both of them showed much lower shear strength in this case. So the reason for mix four is because of the low cracking strength of the matrix. So it cracked at much earlier uh, strength compared to the first three materials. And another reason here is the contribution from the polyethylene fibers is lower than the contribution from the steel fibers, even though they are also uh, 2%. So the same volume fraction, but they showed worse behavior. This figure showed the uh, shear stress versus crack opening of the different mixes. So again, the ECC was the most ductile material compared to the others. But for the other four UHPC, by focusing on this uh, deformation until one millimeter, all of them showed very similar behavior, regardless if they are uh, strain softening or strain hardening under uh, tension load. Here under the pure shear, all of them showed very similar behavior. So mix one shown in green here, even though it's a strain softening under tension load, it showed very good deformation capacity under the pure shear load. And here the crack uh, opening corresponding to the uh, shear strength of all the mixes is almost the same. This figure show the uh, surface strain uh, behavior of the different mixes. So this is a comparison between mix one and mix two. Uh, so again, they show a different behavior in tension, but in this case, under pure shear, they show almost a similar behavior. So at first, when a crack forms, and shortly after the crack forms, the deformation localizes at this single crack, and then the fibers provide some bridging capacity, 
until the peak. And at the peak load here, the, the formation is mostly uh, concentrated at this localized crack, and then the specimen fails at this location. So both of these specimens showed very similar behavior. And then these are the mix four and mix five. So both of these uh, are the strain hardening materials. But in this case, under the pure shear, they showed also similar behavior to the strain softening material. So they didn't provide much more ductility. So there is a slight difference here that the damage region in these two specimens is uh, slightly wider than the previous two specimens. But overall, they show almost similar ductility to the previous two. Another thing is to see the size effect of these different specimens on their shear behavior. So the first uh, photo on the left is the uh, specimens that I talked about. So to see the effect of smaller sizes, we fabricated two other specimens. So having similar dimensions, except the depth of the uh, shear region here is six and three inches instead of nine inches at the first specimen. So here, the uh, area of the shear plane uh, reduces from 36 inches square to 24 and 12 in these two other cases. And then by testing uh, these other specimens, we found that, again, the all four UHPC materials uh, showed higher shear strength with, low, with uh, smaller size. For the case of ECC, it showed very slight increment in the shear strength with the smaller size. So the size effect can be explained uh, based on the failure mode of the specimen. So Bazant categorized uh, three types of failure. So for the uh, brittle materials, uh, they fail due to fracture uh, and then crack propagation. So in this case, the uh, nominal strength of the material is based on the amount of energy released uh, due to the crack propagation. So we expect that larger specimens will have larger cracks, so they will uh, release larger amount of energy so that's why they fail usually at a lower nominal strength. Uh, for the case of ductile materials that fail due to yielding, for example, uh, they are size independent, so their strength is usually constant regardless of the size. And in between these two materials, the quasi-brittle materials are governed by the nonlinear fracture mechanics. Uh, so he proposed this equation to estimate the nominal strength based on the tensile strength of the material and the characteristic size and by using two other constants, B and D naught, uh, depending on the test setup and the specimen dimensions. So by using this equation on our specimens, uh, this is the curve that we get. So we find here that all of the five uh, materials uh, lie well on this uh, expected curve, and all of them show a clear size effect, but at different levels. So for example, here the ECC shown in red uh, show the, le the least size effect compared to the others, so it has very slight size effect. Other UHPCs uh, show very clear size effect in this case. To estimate the shear strength, uh, so as I said, we expect that after the cracking of the matrix, the fibers contribute to provide better shear strength. So if we uh, plot the relationship between the volume fraction of fibers and the post-cracking shear strength, so this is the difference between the ultimate shear strength and the cracking shear strength, so I used uh, the data from these studies. So these are the studies that I found. Uh, so some of them are not UHPC. So the first three studies are high strength fiber reinforced concrete, and the others are UHPC. Uh, so we find that there is a good relationship with the amount of fibers and the post-cracking strength. So there is almost a linear increment in the post-cracking uh, strength with respect to the uh, fiber content. So based on this, we can assume a simple relationship to estimate the ultimate shear strength as a summation of the cracking strength from the matrix and then the post-cracking contribution from the fibers. So by using regression uh, on this equation to determine the parameter A, and then we can determine the uh, predicted shear strength versus the tested shear strength of these different specimens. So here they show a fairly good uh, comparison. So the average uh, ratio between the predicted and the tested strength is 1.1. So to conclude, we found that the direct shear strength of the fiber and faucet composites is governed by the contribution from the matrix until cracking and then the contribution from the fibers after cracking. And the shear deformation capacity in this case is independent uh, from the tensile behavior, whether the material is strain softening or strain hardening. And most of the materials that we studied here showed a clear size effect except the ECC, it had 
uh, lower size effect. And uh, in this study, we proposed a simple empirical equation to estimate the shear strength based on the matrix and the fibers contribution. Thank you.